head south toward US 281 South. camera and then the ND filters that Tiffin soft case I'll take the camera got it I don't like it it does weird things to the image sometimes or like I still haven't figured it all out the variable NDs and then they don't work with a polarizer from what I understand and then like window tinting on vehicles sometimes it looks yeah, ripply and odd and then obviously any kind of screens are usually polarized monitors and stuff. So, and then that one doesn't fit with the lens shade, so you gotta watch out for flaring with the sun. All right, so you're gonna bring that in and the drone, I'll get the Burano. What's your shot assignment for tomorrow? So I'm getting alternate, uh, alternate shots to what you're doing. So you might be getting uh, shots of the speakers I so uh, so I'll be getting shots of the crowd signs and other stuff uh, yeah. good and uh, what aspect ratios do you have to compose for uh, vertical 16 by 9 and horizontal so one for social media one for uh, uh, conventional conventional correct so we enabled the frame lines on both cameras 9 by 16 vertically and then on the Burano, I was able to turn on 9x16 and 1x1. One one. I know they're going to post on Instagram. They said 9x16 for Instagram. Hopefully they do more 1x1 because, man, that frame is so narrow. We have to shoot for both because they also need conventional. It's just uh, such an extreme compromise. I used to complain about having to shoot 16x9 and protect for 4x3. Four, four Old hat learning new things. I know probably the majority of my viewers have been shooting vertical video for years now, and I only do it occasionally. This little patio area. Better watch out for light poles, hold on. Uh, you're good. Oh yeah, I see the drone. It's to my right, right? Or just open parking lot, okay. There's one to my right slightly. I gotta stop being the hero because I get punished whenever I yeah. play hero. So I learned my lesson with that one. I no longer drop everything to do something like that until they agree Yeah, unless it's like a repeat client, you already get all the terms and relationship established. <laughs> My first news style assignment with the Burano and shooting B-roll in real time in and out of the shade. ND settings, I was struggling a bit, full manual, but it's a very fine adjustment when you spin the ND wheel. I need a coarser setting. Mike, the photographer, and I were able to influence a bit where the lectern was placed for the presentations. Not optimum for the crowd, but I wanted to have the signage and the store behind the presenter and then also the side of the building that was in the shade. And then the PA system required AC power, but we didn't want to string a stinger from the building as a trip hazard. So I parked my van in the background frame left and we ran the, off the inverter. Where'd you come in? Look at that, he's wrapping those cables with attitude like he's been in the guild for 20 years. Over, over, good work. Still on location, had to pare down selects, made a seven minute file and uploaded it to the editor so they could put together an Instagram reel and get it out within an hour of the event concluding. You'll see that coming up next and I hope I don't get another copyright strike from the music that's in the, the reel. And then there's a second component to the footage delivery. When I get home, I need to upload all the raw footage for future use and marketing purposes. The reel was just one of the assignments. There's also doing some conventional 16 by nine edits that will get posted on other platforms. And then I assume they're just gonna use it for general purpose. Seven minute timeline, about 650 megs. Well, we're next door to location. I uploaded selects to the agency. 
We're just on standby in case there's some shot I didn't get that they want me to go back and get. Yeah, I muted the audio. I don't want to risk another copyright music strike on YouTube, but you can watch the original on Instagram on the company's page. They use some of my soundbite selects from the presentations, all the Nat sound, and pretty impressed with how fast they turned this and posted it. Good work. This assignment was a little bit different than my usual, but the production workflow and estimating is the same. So I got the phone call from my client to put together a little crew, still photographer and a video shooter for this launch event at this restaurant. This is a franchise in multiple states. So this was just like one opening. So there's an agency involved and it's more, you know, big corporate budgets versus supporting a, say a local business and working with the a one-off restaurant owner. So I can charge what I guess I'm saying is my sort of standard corporate rates. So this was a, a travel gig for me, but the still photographer, I was able to source someone local. And on something like this, existing client, I just do a pass through on that. Like I'm the approved vendor. So I paid the photog as a subcontractor. And then I just pass through their cost on my invoice back to client. In this case, I paid COD to the photographer and I got to wait 30 days to get the check from my client, but I got my rate and some travel time is billable. So I'm happy to do a little pass through like that. I don't like feel the need to itemize and mark up. And also there's always a risk for me. I have a four hour travel day in. I want to be somewhat competitive with if they're price shopping another local DP that doesn't have the, the travel overhead. So in this case, photographer, flat rate for the day that included editing down selects, but not retouching and upload same day for social media. Same for me on the video side. So I just gave them my standard minimum package rate for my time and gear for the shoot day. And then instead of traveling or charging a full travel day, I was able to drive in the evening before four hour drive. And I just have an hourly rate for travel. This just covers, you know, my labor, but I'm not charging any obviously gear rentals on a travel in like that. And then I get standard US IRS mileage, 67 cents a mile, worked out to $356. Now I estimated drive time from my home to the location and then times it by two for round trip. My actual mileage is a little higher because I had the hotel and we had a couple meals. But on something like this where there's a PO involved, I just stick to the approved estimate. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't try to hit them for an extra 10 or $20 in, in mileage. And then I got pre-approved just 200 bucks for a hotel stay. And I'm, I'm just billing them the 200 versus expensing back. Like I think it was a $145 actual cost. For meals, I didn't charge because I want to be somewhat reasonably priced relative to a local shooter. They already covered my hotel and my drive time. I had my son with me. He wasn't on the budget, but I had him assisting for me and I'm paying him. Uh, I paid him for 10 hours on our day and then covered his time on the travel in. I got pre-approved a four hour drive time return day. And what I said was, you've got me at the venue for 10 hour package rate. The scheduled time of th things was only like two hours and figured we'd get there an hour before to set up and work out kinks. So three hours on site. If I can keep it under 10 between call time and when I get home, I won't charge you on the return day. It's just effectively part of the short day, shoot day. Uh, we got pre-approved the expense for me to buy a hard drive and FedEx it or a cloud transfer. Cloud transfer was the plan and it was two tiered. I had to edit the select. And then when I got home that night, I pushed all the raw footage, two cameras, and it was about 85 gigs in UHD AVCL. The Burano factory handle interferes with the small rig clip-on. On my FX9, the shape handle solved that second, even with this fully extended, it's a little short and I believe I get a little extra length plus the offset with the shape handle. So I bought a FX9 shape handle and I'm hoping it's compatible. There's also a Burano one. It was like $125. This was on sale. I think it was 87 B and H. We'll see if it fits. Well, my memory's off. The shape handle yields the same extension as the Sony handle. It's just, you get this offset. So now it clears the map box at full extension. And this push button is much easier to find and manipulate when the camera's on my shoulder. So this will go in the parts box with the FX9 handle, viewfinder extension. I have a NATO rail seven inch on order, it just hasn't come in yet. I believe it's, this is six inches. So it'll give me about one more inch of EVF extension, which will be 
appreciated. And then I think next up, like I did on my FX9 A can, I'm gonna remove these XLR dust caps because I'm out in the field and sweating. It's 100 degrees out here in Texas right now. Pressure of patching in, shooting events, news type of stuff. These things are trouble. Dust caps removed, it's just one screw per. Much easier to patch XLRs now. Be sure if you do this to reinstall the screw because it is one of the two chassis attachment points for the XLR connector. It was flexing in when I didn't have that screw in there. Adding an ND 1.882 mil for the FX3 gimbal kits. Screw on the 24 to 70 because uh, I haven't been happy with this variable ND as expensive as it was. Responding to a request from a viewer, how do I put together these vlogs? So it starts with how I left off the last video. I keep a running set of notes called Cranky Notes. And anytime I think of a topic or a scenario happens on a project, I note it here in my notes. And I've got pages of stuff from like the last five, maybe six years. And I'm going to blur a lot of this because I've got client names in there, people names, things that I need to sanitize. A lot of the stuff I end up not covering. I don't want to be negative. And kind of a lot of the things like when I'm overtired or pissed off at a scenario, I write it down. I don't want to create all these grumbly videos. Although those do get a lot of views. Last year, I put together a video titled Everyone's Working But Me. And it was one of the highest viewed vlogs for me of that year. But I'm not interested in chasing views. I'll get, I'll get into that. This week's timeline in Final Cut X, it's the only editing app I have nowadays. I shoot everything on my iPhone for simplicity and least path of resistance. And then once a week, I airdrop the previous week's footage onto my MacBook and drop it on the timeline and I edit sequentially. Everything is linear. I try to capture footage that has usable SOTs, usable sound on tape, which is how the beginning of this vlog plays out. I got just natural sound with my GPS running as I'm walking back to the van pit stop, introduce that my son's on board with me, and then we get to the hotel and we're prepping the night before, just got the natural sound of that playing out, and then once we get into the hotel room and we're prepping, got natural sound again, the SOT that tells the story, and then as a last resort, when I'm editing here, I go back and drop in VO, so here's VO down here during the event. I, I treat VO purely as a cleanup process. I strive to capture everything so that it never requires VO. And then it's just mop up when I need to tighten things up. My weakness is I'm constantly repeating myself. I try to keep in mind every time I press record to only speak about the present. Don't talk about what I previously did or what's coming up next. Because then when I get on the timeline, I realize I'm talking about what I'm about to do. And then I'm narrating on what I'm actually doing. And then after the fact, I'm tearing the gear down, putting it away, cleaning it up. And I'm talking about what I just did. And I don't like that. I like everything to just be present tense when possible. And I fail at this every week week <laughs> this blog in particular it's the kind of thing i like to avoid like i don't want to get into putting in graphics and slides and slide deck but i've had requests for this it was in my notes and my original goal with these vlogs was not necessarily to do bts and when i started vlogging i think 2019 i, I was doing mostly commercial work and like celebrity and pro sports stuff all things that i couldn't show any of the client content. So I was focused more on the business side of freelancing because those were the conversations we were all having on set, you know, our struggles with billing, getting enough days, managing cash flow. Like you've got 20 grand in receivables and a hundred dollars in your bank account and all your bills are due on the first. Like how do you manage that long term and make it a sustainable career? How do you start a family? And then things have sort of more from there. I relocated to Texas. My client base shifted. I'm doing more one man band stuff now, more news centric content, which is where I started and it's gone full circle since COVID. And fortunately that's been stuff that is um, not so NDA heavy or there is no NDA and I, I can vlog about it. Going back 2016, maybe 2017, I worked at a search optimization conference. I was just one of the cam ops in the back of the room shooting presenters. And the main topics I covered were optimizing views and results on YouTube. And they had a few YouTube 
employees there to present and then some third party companies talking about the algorithm and optimization and you know how to get views and subscribers and uh one of the takeaways i had back then i don't know if it's still relevant but at that time everyone was hammering the kind of traditional tv like keep it short people don't want to watch long content you know a minute three minutes maybe five minutes and the people from youtube flipped that all upside down for me they basically said that at that point in time the typical watch session of a youtube user was about 45 to an hour they don't tend to click on like three six minute videos they want to make an investment in something that's going to fill that time and then they're watching like uh one to three longer form videos per viewing session now this was years ago i don't know if it's still that it's the case, but that's made it easier for me vlogging because uh, I try to get like 18 to 20 minute vlog post each week. And then the whole ad revenue side of YouTube is you're compensated more as the runtime increases because you have the, the mid roll ads. I mean, it, it's so minuscule for me. I don't really uh, chase the revenue at all. So with that in mind, 20 minute vlog posts, linear form, I only publish once a week. I know I could get more traffic and subscribers and view count if I posted every couple of days, but I'm not trying to make this a business. This is um, more a marketing tool to some extent for what I do. And it was also just something for me to do. I was bored and kind of wanted to support this production community. And I get a couple bookings a year that are come from viewers or a referral from someone that follows my YouTube channel and bigger than jobs I brought in, I've been able to hire other crew and refer my clients to other owner operators and other parts of the world that happens a couple times a year. And then it's been good for me too. In Texas, I've met a few crew people that we're now working together. All right, we'll wrap this up here. I've hit a slow patch for August. Historically, I'm slamming busy in August. A lot of that was the back to school and holiday advertising and product marketing season. Historically, July was always dead for me because my agency, production company, corporate clients take their family vacations in July. And this year, July was one of my, I think, yeah, maybe number two or number three top months of the year. Well, that's the life of freelancing, just inconsistent consistency. We can continue this discussion in the comments below. Thanks for watching.